since we have four speakers today, kind of four, um, let's get started. People will file in as they will. Um, so I am going to, we're, we're very excited to uh, introduce uh, Yixing, Ted, Victor, and Alex. And um, let's just go in, in that order, unless anybody has any other uh, uh, suggestions. Um, I'm going to be a little bit draconian and limit everybody to, to 12 minutes. Um, so that gives us uh, 48 minutes of speaker and then 12 minutes of Q&A. Uh, let's do, uh, we're, we're gonna, oh, okay. Well, uh, then he is not going to go first. Uh, then we'll, we'll start with Ted. Um, the, uh, let's, we'll, we'll do a full Q&A at the end for everybody so that uh, every, we can get through all the presentations. However, uh, as always, like definitely drop questions in the chat, have a lively discussion there. Um, and then if you're a speaker and you see someone ask a question related to your talk after you're done with the talk, like feel free to, to address that question. Um, so we'll, we can use the, the full prowess of this internet platform. Um, all right, cool. Uh, then let's uh, get started with Ted. All right, I'm pasting a big thing into the uh, ch chat. Let's see if it works. Um, uh, okay, there it is, good. Okay, and I'm going to, uh, so these are just some references uh, so I don't have to tell you them later. Uh, oops, uh, close the chat and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, and uh, share. Okay, can anybody see my screen? Works. You can see your screen. Okay, great. All right. Okay. So uh, last, uh, I guess, November or December, Eric Drexler spoke here and talked about um, building blocks made out of beta solenoid proteins uh, that can be assembled into long ribbons. And uh, here's the ribbon. Um, these are uh, antifreeze proteins from insects. Uh, this one here is my favorite uh, RIAFP from this inquisitor beetle. So this is a top view of the uh, block, for the, the, the unit, and this is the end view here. And then here is a view of two top views joined together. Here's the place where they're joined. Sorry, this arrow here shows where they're joined. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's not a covalent bond, but there's lots and lots of uh, positive and negative charges that, that match up. There's even a disulfur bond there. Um, so it's a, a pretty strong bond. Uh, but, and so you make these long things like this. Now, what we want to do is make uh, ribbons like this and then have them double back and make shapes uh, that and go into 3D, uh, where each one of them is modified in its own way. So that we, you know, um, have uh, an active component attached to the side of this block that will do something when we've got the shape all assembled. So we can make little machines. That's the idea here. And, um, oops, I'm going to... Um, Okay, so the hard part is how do you add just one block to an assemblage of blocks? And let's take the example of the way that peptides are synthesized by humans. Um, and that is you have a protected surface at the end of the thing you're growing, and then you remove the protection, and then you add a block that sticks on there, but the new block has got, um, uh, um, the new block has got uh, protection on it, so it can't grow. So the idea is you can you are able to add just one block at a time to a structure. Uh, is this clear? Um, this is the uh, so you know we're borrowing this from regular protein chemistry, uh, but of course we're making it with much bigger uh, blocks. Um, okay. Uh, and now you it would be a really good idea if we're growing a structure uh, to uh, to grow in several directions at once or not um, at least be able to grow on several fronts so like if it's a 3d structure it would be good to be adding blocks in x and in y and in z and then uh, maybe another row uh, just you want to add blocks in several different places okay so that means you can't just deprotect all the the ends uh, and then add blocks because then you'll get the same block in every place and we don't want that. We want every block to be unique in this structure we're building. Um, so you could have different ways to remove the caps. Uh, if you if the caps are the, the protection at the end of the block to keep it from uh, growing uncontrollably. 
or you could deeper you could uh, remove all the caps and have faces of the blocks that are incompatible and um so uh, both of these are available uh so let's say we want to build a shape of 20 blocks and let's say we wanted four growth fronts uh, that maybe would be enough uh, one would be enough if we made a single snake but many things are not uh you know uh, that wouldn't work for many things um, okay, so we could have two cap removal methods and two kinds of faces that would make four different ones, or we could have four different cap removals, or we could have four incompatible faces. Uh, so there's lots of choices here. Okay, so this is where we were last December thinking about this. Uh, but then this paper appeared by Longjing uh, Cao and 33 co authors, including David Baker, that came out on March 24th, and they described a pretty amazing thing which is you, they can take any patch on any protein, existing protein, as long as it's got four um, hydrophobic groups on it, uh, they can design a cap from scratch that will stick to that area. And it will stick very hard. Uh, in fact, you can boil the thing and it won't come off. Um, and they do this with computation. They have this uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper, there's this flow chart of like, I don't know, 20 different steps they go through to get uh, different computational things that they run to find the cap. And it is just amazing. Um, okay, and so now they wanted to, put, to bind things very tightly. That would work for blocks. So if, we, if, if their technique designed a block, then those blocks would stick together and they would not come apart. Uh, but what about using them to design the caps, uh, which is the part we don't have? Uh, so um, that we, I'm sure it'd be possible to design caps that stick less well than the ones that they worked so hard to, to make, because uh, they had less, well, less sticking ones along the way. Um, okay, uh, and then, okay, so that, would, so that would be a way to get the caps. Uh, and so some work is needed here. Um, the, uh, the idea of making a single block out of two of their caps back to back, let's say this cap and that cap uh, back to back uh, to make a block. Um, the problem is that this is very convex here. You see, this is a bump, this is, this is convex, and this is not that good either. And if you if I look at all uh, their standard caps that they made was three alpha helixes and very convex on the backside. And they don't have any control of the backside because they want everything to work right here to make this stick to the target protein. And so they'll do whatever they need to do to the backside to make that work, um, you know, to make this curve in the right way. Okay, so what are we doing here? Okay, so uh, so there, if we could just get the the people who make these caps to uh, make the right kind of caps, we would be able to actually make these protein structures right now, arbitrary structures with arbitrary functionalization, um, and make you know billions of them at the same time in a single pot, uh, and have control over where each block. Uh, have control over where each block goes. Okay. Um, so uh, one last thing I want to mention here, like, um, so consider a cell, uh, there's, uh, like a thousand different kinds of proteins in the water in the cell, and they're all colliding all the time. If you've seen these diagrams of tracing one of them in real time, it's just amazing how they have, you know, thousands of collisions per second. Um, okay. If they all stuck to each other, you'd have a fried egg because that's when a bunch of proteins stick together. Uh, if they never stuck to each other, uh, you wouldn't be able to form uh, quad subunits of hemoglobin, you, and all the processes of the cell wouldn't work because they uh, depend on proteins sticking together, doing something, and then splitting apart again. Um, so, so what can we do about this? Um, the, uh, a protein service has topology, as you saw, it's, it's got bumps and uh, you know, um, a landscape. It's a bumpy lump. Uh, and more importantly, uh, besides the topology, it's got electrical charge. So every, every um, pro, uh, amino acid there is positive, negative, or neutral, hydrophobic. Um, so for two proteins to stick together, uh, the topology has to match. And then the charge pattern has to match. And so this gives plenty of combinations. This gives, you can have millions of, of proteins, uh, little bits of protein surface in a cell that do not stick to each other because they've each got a different topology or charge pattern. And so that gives plenty of variability to work with. Uh, so um, this, this makes all of this possible. Okay, so it, we are very close to um, 
this thing is pointing out my spelling errors. I don't like that. Um, this thing is, very, we are very close to being able to make arbitrary shapes of protein building blocks, each one, each building block having a different modification on it so that it will do something when the machine is assembled. And then with these machines, we hope to make better machines uh, that will, uh, you know, this is starting on the path to uh, quote, real nanotechnology, unquote. Um, okay, that's what I have to say. I think I'll stop sharing here. Uh, uh, okay, um, since I have a little bit of time here, anybody uh, have questions understanding what I'm saying? I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, I have just a, a quick question. Um, so yes. is, there any, is there any restrictions on the yield you can get from these kinds of um, processes yet? Or, or are they specific enough to, to yeah, I don't. I don't know the um, uh, the experiments. Uh, the pa first paper I put in the chat is about the uh, making those long uh, fibers out of the um, antifreeze proteins. Uh, they actually incubated them for a week, so uh, so they were apparently having a yield problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with with designing the interfaces, uh, it could go very fast and have very high yield. And you know, um, uh, normal chemical processes that do this deprotection thing, uh, they actually have pretty good yield. Um, and you could here's what you could do. Supposing the yield was bad, you make five blocks together, and then uh, you make separately you make another five blocks together, and then you throw them into the same pot, and they'll stick together. And so you could you know actually build up that way, but not having to oh, do so from from components that way. Yeah. Right. You could so you at at worst case you could if only <laughs> let's see you could. Um, you could uh, make the yeah make components and then put them together, and that would allow you to have a very low yield and still be able to do something. Mm -hmm. But I, ex I expect the yields to be very good. And I'm not an experimentalist, by the way, so I, I can't actually do this. We need help. So Ted, uh, yes. um, in order to get a feel for yields, if you look at com some commercial uh, peptides that have been made on around, around the market. Uh -huh. Calcitonin is 31 amino acids, uh -huh. and the okay. actual commercial yield after purification is in the 20% range. I and that's see. just okay. 31 amino acids. Okay, so you have to have purification basically to make this work. Uh, yeah. And one of the steps I didn't mention there in you, you join the um, uh, you, you put in a new block, it joins to the end, and then you wash away all the blocks uh, that are, are did not get. Um, uh, uh, connected, and you have the structure that you're building attached to a bead, say, so that it, it stays and you can wash everything else away. Uh, but that still doesn't account for things that don't get a block at the end. Um, so at the end, you probably need a purification step. It's true. But I'm, I'm hoping somebody tackles all this. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Um, we have 20 seconds left. Uh, oh, okay. So, so let's, let's hold that until the end. Um, sure. And uh, Alex, do you want to go next? All right, excellent. Okay, so I can um, share the screen. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to this um, group today um, about what, I guess we really have more of a um, bio-motivated approach to molecular machines where a lot of our, our problems we want to solve with them are biological. Um, so, so my research group kind of has two um, uh, general areas. Let me go ahead and start the show. Um, you know, on, on this top are projects that are really making molecular switches, which I would argue are kind of a, a, a preliminary molecular machine aimed at imaging biological systems. but. What I want to talk about today is a newer project in my lab where we've actually developed some uh, equipment uh, using microscopy and, and chemical micropatterning to be able to pattern chemistry at, at very high resolution with, a, with an aim to get down to the uh, single molecule resolution. And I presented a, a few of these slides at a previous one, so I apologize for to anyone who has um, maybe seen a little bit of this already. Um, so our, our goal, again, I said, we kind of have a, a bio-motivated approach. So one of the things we really want to do with this project is to be able to um, 
meet the increasing demand for miniaturization. Of course, this is important in a lot of uh, established fields, um, integrated circuits, circuits, photovoltaics, but kind of our, our dream is to one day make these types of uh, nanorobotic systems that could be perhaps used in um, interesting ways to, to treat um, diseases that might not be uh, tractable by standard methods. If you think about what would go into a uh, nanobot, a lot of the components would be single molecule components. And it's interesting that, that you know, we, we actually have a lot of these single molecule components. Um, single molecule motors, of course, um, received the Nobel Prize not too long ago. Uh, single molecule logic gates are, are known, single molecule switches, sensors, and actuators. These are all known, but when, when you make these using a um, bottom-up approach, you generally get a big flask of molecular motors. How are you going to make a machine or a nanorobot with that? And so our thought is that or our kind of approach is that the, the key issue here is how do you piece these molecules together um, with really high precision? Ultimately, I think what we need is a single molecule precision. Can we do the chemistry at a single molecule level? And, and we ideally think that um, actually a top uh, down approach would be ideal for this. Um, so what we've um, done recently and, and published um, is we developed a, um, a fluorescence microscope that uses digital light processing with a number of different photochemical systems to be able to do chemistry at the ultra, ultra small scale, um, including uh, patterning microscopic beads on um, polymer films uh, in living cells. Again, kind of this uh, biologically motivated approach, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, as well as microscopic 3D printing. Uh, I do want to highlight this is work done um, by uh, Uru Perez, Josh Plank, and Bo Lee, led by Uru, and a lot of these slides she actually prepared, so I do want to give her credit for that. Um, so this is kind of what we've done. So we've built a microscope um, where instead of a traditional light source, we use a, a DLP projector where we can pattern light through a microscope objective. Um, here um, is an image where we project a diagonal lines pattern onto a, a target side. We get very high resolution of a, a couple hundred nanometers. <clears throat> we can then use this pattern light to mediate photochemical reactions. And we've done a couple of them. One is a, a photochemical thiolene click reaction. So wherever we pattern the light onto um, microscopic beads that have a thiol, we can uh, initiate a reaction between the thiol and an alkene to, to label it with the molecule that we desire. Here we're using a fluorescent dye so we can use, easily track it. So using this, we can take the beads, and this is just an image of the beads of the microscope that have thiols on them. We pattern the light here, a, di a, a, a horizontal lines pattern. Um, and this is during the patterning. And then after time, we can turn to a solid field of illumination and see that wherever the light intersected the beads, we patterned it with a fluorescent dye. So we can do lots of different patterning, grid shape. Um, Uru was able to do a uh, yin yang, yeah, yeah, easily readable text. And in this system, we get a resolution of about eight uh, micrometers. Um, another photochemical system that gives us better contrast is this uh, diazo ketone system. This actually gives a turn on response. So it goes from non-fluorescent to fluorescent, which gives us much better uh, contrast because we don't have um, the dye floating in the background. And you can see we can do this on the beads, again, getting good contrast. Um, we can also use the system, this uh, molecule in other systems in living cells. We can, we can pattern living cells. Um, this is kind of a, a confluent field that uh, I think this is uh, four times magnification. And we can you know, uh, pattern a checkerboard field on the cells. We could do half a field uh, with, with patterning and half out. And here we're releasing this rhodamine dye. But you can imagine using other types of photocage molecules or what could be interesting is um, molecular motors. I know with, in relation to some of um, Victor's work that could be interesting, we could um, target the motors to single cells or even uh, different uh, specific parts of a single cell. And we've demonstrated we can get to the single cell resolution. I think we can do actually higher resolution, but this dye quickly diffuses through the cell. So we don't really see that uh, subcellular resolution, but with the right molecule, I think we could see that. Um, interestingly, if we do this on a PVA film, we can actually get photo quality, uh, photograph quality resolution. So really high resolution, about two, two micrometers. And we also get kind of a gray scale. So we're not just patterning in a space. We can also um, kind of control the uh, image intensity. Um, we can use two, two different colors of light to, to do both of these simultaneously on the same bead, or I, I guess sequentially, but putting two different patterns. So we're patterning two different molecules on the same bead, which with pretty good orthogonality. Um, and then we can also use this for polymerization. So we can do kind of 2D prints. This is with a uh, visible light polymerization system developed by Zach Page at UT Austin. And we can also start doing some uh, 3D micro printing. So um, my, my student Josh was able to turn this into a 3D printer pretty easily um, using a, a motorized Z translation stage. 
And so we can make uh, preliminary 3D prints, something that we were actually actively exploring to make them um, microbots, uh, propulsion controlled microbots. Now I want to end with kind of where we're going with this. So I mentioned to the key challenge I see for making something like a nanorobot is really doing the chemistry precisely um, at the single molecule level. And so right now we're not there yet, but what we hope to do is combine this technique with the super resolution microscopy, particularly single, lo single molecule localization microscopy, to actually do photochemistry at single molecule sites. So just a quick overview, a uh, review of um, uh, single molecule localization microscopy. Um, it basically breaks the diffraction limit by assuring that you're only imaging light from a single molecule using a blinking dye. So if you have a, a labeled, um, a labeled sample, like a cell, um, usually microtubules, you have a dye that is usually in an off state, non fluorescent, but by virtue of its uh, molecular structure, every now and then it can blink on into a fluorescent state. And if you know this is coming from one molecule, you can actually analyze the point spread function, kind of how the light spreads, to pinpoint it down to 20 nanometers. Now, for imaging, you kind of pinpoint it, it blinks off, a different one blinks on, you pinpoint it, and over time, you can build a, a super resolution image of the, uh, of the sample. Now, our idea is to combine this with um, the, the photochemistry. So what we have to do is couple the blinking so that when it's on, it releases a chemical functional group that we can then do a photochemical reaction. So only when it's fluorescent, if we shine it with light, we can tag a molecule um, to that spot and not any of the other spots. So when it's in the closed form, it's a sulfide and these can no longer react in the photochemical reaction. So in this way, we can assure that the reaction is happening only at that single molecule. Um, so this is what we're working on. We've actually um, kind of falsified this uh, initial hypothesis shown here in A, um, but we have two other systems that are looking promising. So this is something that we're hoping to um, accomplish in the next year or so. And we're really excited to you know, work with other people in this group, you know, how can we use you know, this tool with a single molecule site, but, but also, um, you know, this, this high uh, resolution micro uh, printing and patterning, I think that still has a lot of usefulness for some of the things this group wants to achieve. Um, so yeah, just some key points. Um, you know, we constructed this DLP microscope. Um, we demonstrated patterning, uh, chemical micro patterning on beads, PVA films, and in cells, as well as um, some 3D micro printing. And we're currently working on this single molecule lithography. Um, yeah, just to kind of highlight the students once again, you know, this was really uh, led by Uru Paris, some um, kind of a senior grad student in my lab. Um, so we're we'll looking for industry jobs in, in about a year now. So if any of these skills look applicable to any any and any of you or anyone any that you know, you know, please please do reach out. Um, yeah, so so thank you all. Um, if we have time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, what does DLP stand for? Uh, DLP is a digital light processing. So in a, um, you know, the, the projectors you use to give a PowerPoint presentation when you're, when you're live. So basically um, how that works is there's a little uh, chip in there that's uh, an array of micromirrors. And you can, uh, you, can, you can change the tilt of each micromirror independently. So in that way you can kind of well control the pixels um, in, in the projection. So we're basically using that same chip, but, but instead of like projecting it, making it larger or focusing it down and making it smaller. This is a general question, but um, I think it's really interesting, uh, you know, this, this idea that you can kind of do single molecule um, chemistry in, using this platform. And I guess I'm wondering, uh, what do you think the most interesting questions that you can ask and answer with that tool um, are? In, in in the context of your of your projector setup, yeah, and that's a that's an expansive that's a great question, but it's an expansive one. You know, we have actually now a lot of ideas coming out, both um, technology we could develop and questions we could answer. Um, kind of on the you know within the theme of uh, biologically motivated um, approaches, one thing that we could answer, for example, if we can use this in biological systems we could excite specific parts of a cell, for example, a, um, a synapse of a neuron, right? We could target one synapse specifically, see what that does. And you can do this with like a laser and two photon, but additionally, we could target two synapses specifically or three or four, or these synapses at the same time releasing neurotransmitters, you know, some, somewhere else in the cell or activating the microglia. So 
I think the, the types of questions you can answer with this system when combined with, with optogenetics is essentially what I'm talking about, um, are, are pretty, pretty far reaching. Um, my, uh, if you're asking me my specific interest, you know, this, these neuronal, neuronal systems are one that I think would be cool. You know, can you play the neurons like, like piano chords, right? And you get a different response if you're just playing one note over and over again. So that's something that I'd probably have to seek some collaborations. My neuronal, my neuron culturing skills aren't so great. Um, that's one, one that I'd like to go after. And then for technology, I think um, we're actively looking at building um, kind of preliminary, I call them microbots, not nanobots yet. Um, but we, we developed, uh, discovered some new propulsion systems where you can have like a metal catalyst, appropriate molecule that produces gas and, and cause some propulsion systems. So we've made some spherical ones that kind of propel around, but now we can, you know, precisely control the shape, the size, and, you know, have multiple catalytic sites. And so I, I think there's a lot of things we could do, you know, making spinners or, you know, light control directionality. So I, I think there's a whole, um, field there for micro robotics that hopefully in the next five years, we could actually then go towards that more nano robotic um, aspect of it. All right, that is awesome. I have a lot of questions, but I will save them for the end. Uh, I'm gonna invite Victor to go ahead uh, because I do not see it. you seeing here yet. Okay, so can everyone see the slides? Yeah, okay, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about using light-driven molecular motors uh, for applications in biomedicine. Uh, some of the work that I'm uh, talking today, uh, I did it before in the group of Professor James Tour at Rice University, um, but now I am now at uh, LSU. Um, so the idea that we had uh, back in the days was using the Feringa motor, which is a motor that, you know, when you apply light, it can rotate in one direction and we can tune uh, the frequency of this rotation. So we decided that because these motors are very hydrophobic, uh, ideal place to, to put these motors in, in a cell was the membrane. So we were interested in studying the effect of these motors in membranes. And we found out that we can actually disrupt the membrane. We can kill cells by, by using these motors. So if we wanted to kill a cell, well, we want to kill a, a, hurt, a harmful uh, cell. So we decided to focus on, on cancer cells. And we proposed that these motors could eventually become a new photodynamic therapy. And the idea is that they kill the cells by mechanical uh, disruption. So they don't use the traditional photodynamic therapy where you produce a reactive oxygen species, but it's more like a converting light into mechanical motion and using this mechanical motion to disrupt the, the membrane. And eventually uh, the cells get into so much stress and then they break and then you kill the cells. And these motors are not toxic um, and we can control the frequency. So one of the limitations is that these motors traditionally are activated by UV, UV light, which it has very low tissue penetration. So it limits uh, the areas where you can put uh, uh, some uh, LED in the uh, fiber optic uh, in the body. But there are some motors that can be activated with visible light and recently in the near infrared light. There's still some limitation, but I think it's promising. And what we saw as an advantage is that by using light, you can focus the activation of the motors to a specific region, so you don't have side effects in other parts of the body. Uh, and you can also target, uh, functionalize these motors with some receptors or that with some ligands that can uh, bind some receptors in only cancer cells. So we have two levels of selectivity. Um, so this is the, the first uh, try. So UV light is uh, bad for the cells. So UV light will also kill the cells. And we noticed that the cells died just with UV light. They start dying between 300 seconds and they are completely dead after 600 seconds of irradiation. But when we have the motors, the cells start dying faster. So UV will kill the cells, but if you have the motors plus UV light, the motor is going to rotate and the mechanical uh, move mail will disrupt the cells and the membranes and will kill the cells faster than just UV uh, light. And we can observe that by following the fluorescence of propidium iodide, which cannot internalize in healthy cells, but if the membranes are disrupted, then it can internalize 
and then you can uh, see that the cells are dead. So we can kill uh, cells with these motors. Um, we also did the whole cell uh, patch clamp experiments where we mentioned the, the current of the membrane. And we observed that when we have the motor and a control that has not a rotor, so it's not a motor, um, without any UV activation, there is no change in the current uh, of the membrane, meaning that the membrane is without disruption. And then at least for uh, some minutes, uh, when you when you have when you excite with UV light or when you have the motor and you sorry the control with with UV light, we also did not observe any disruption, and we only observed the changes in the current. Oh sorry, um, when we have the motor. So this means that these experiments are telling you that you are creating some type of pores or holes in the membrane that are changing the ion flow um, across the membrane, which uh, demonstrate that these motors can. Uh, disrupt uh, the membranes. And we have here the images where in the top, we have before and after irradiation using the control where we don't see any significant changes in the cells. But when we have in the bottom part, uh, we have before and after irradiating the motors for four minutes. And we can see these uh, white arrows indicate the contents uh, uh, of the cells coming out because of the disruption of the membrane. Um, and of course, these motors by itself, they are not selective, so they, they will bind into any membrane because of hydrophobic effect. So we decided to functionalize with peptides that can be recognized by receptors that are overexpressed in a specific uh, lines of cancer cells. Um, and we can see we have two types of cells sitting next to each other. And when we have the motor functionalized just with this proper alcohol, uh, we kill both cells because we don't have any selectivity. When we use this uh, peptide that is, sel is uh, selective only for prostate cancer cells, we can kill only the cancer cells and not the other, other cells. Similarly, for this other peptide, we, we replace the peptide and we put this uh, peptide that is selective for breast cancer cells, and we can kill only the breast cancer cell and not the other. Of course, over time, we kill both of them because of the UV effect, but if we if we study the cells for a shorter window, window of time, we only kill um, the ones that have the motors. Um, so we did these studies where we demonstrate we can have selectivity uh, and these motors are not toxic by itself. They only kill the cells when you activate them because they disrupt the membrane. So, but having the motor sitting in the membrane, it doesn't do much um, without activation. Uh, and again, one of the problem, one of the limitations of this system is using UV. So we went ahead and we found that this motor can have a small uh, two photon absorption and we exploit that. So we excite this motor to two photon excitation at 710 nanometers, which is near the uh, infrared uh, region. Um, unfortunately, the absorption is still slow, uh, sorry, low so that we have to use a lot of energy. The intensity of the laser is very strong. So it's still, even if it is in the near infrared, we, we still kill the cells just with the laser, but you know we kill it in around 20 uh, minutes. But when we have the motors, we kill the, the cells faster. And again, uh, we, this is not selective, so we can kill uh, any type of cells. And by, select, by connecting the motors uh, to some peptides or any, any other ligand, we can have some selectivity. And um, we also use these uh, motors to kill even bigger microorganisms like these uh, C. elegans, these worms. Uh, and, and here the setup is very simple. We have our plates with the worms and then we use an LED, we irradiate, and we can see that um, only the motors that rotate at fast frequency can kill the worms. If we use motors that rotate very, very slow, uh, in solution, the motor here in red um, can do up to 3 million of rotations per second versus this one that is really, really slow that maybe do three rotations per hour, but you have to warm it up at 60 degrees. So it's basically a switch and not a motor at room temperature. So with this motor, the slow one, we don't see any killing of cancer cells or, or the worms. So our hypothesis is that these motors you know can produce mechanical forces in the membrane and they can disrupt the membrane and kill kill the cells so now i'm going to talk about the work from other people which i think is also in this uh, uh aligned uh, these ideas 
Here, this is the work of uh, Josepone and Del Campo, where they functionalize these motors with these uh, polymer chains and they attach them to a surface. And in the other half, they have these uh, ligands that can bind to these uh, integrins or these receptors in the membranes. So when they activate the motor, the motor starts rotating and start pulling uh, these receptors and it produces uh, forces on the membrane and it can uh, increase the focal adhesion of the cells. And also if they can uh, activate T cells and induce uh, calcium signaling. So this is a very interesting uh, idea where you use small molecules, of course, uh, to produce forces on the membrane, either in the membrane, like in our work, or by uh, um, pulling receptors from the membrane and controlling some uh, cell function. Also by the group of uh, Professor uh, Feringa, um, they also put motors on a glass surface and some uh, protein. So when the motor is rotating, it denaturizes the protein and it can change, it can control the fate of these uh, cells. Uh, and more recently, they use these uh, artificial muscles that are made also with uh, motors and this they can bend with, when they, the motor is active. And they found out that the cells can survive this. But I think this is in the, uh, I visualize that in the future, we are going to see more and more of these motors um, to control uh, uh, cell function. Um, so what are the challenges? Of course, one of the challenges is the UV activation, but I think more and more we are seeing uh, motors that act with uh, visible light or near infrared light. For some uh, applications, maybe solubility uh, may be an issue. Uh, can we work on other organelles? That's an open question. Most of this work has been on membranes or membrane receptors. Can we target other type of organelles? Uh, in vivo studies are also like an open question. Uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunities where we can develop therapies as we demonstrate for cancer. We also did some studies in bacteria to, to kill uh, uh, drug resistant bacteria. It can also be used for regenerative medicine uh, to develop new biomaterials, tissue engineering, or to develop tools in cell biology to study uh, me mechanotransduction. Um, so that's what I have. And if you have questions, so, so the the thought is that we just go straight to questions for open up for questions for everybody. So, Victor and uh, everybody else. Uh, Victor, I had a couple of questions. If yes, I could. Um, so, uh, first question: We started uh, great, great work as always. Um, I, I, we started doing some photothermal. Um, agents and looking at that. So I'm curious if you see any photothermal effect from these motors. Do they heat up as they as they spin? Is that something that has been uh, yeah, so, or? Okay, so we we actually tried different motors and not only Feringa motors, but other type of motors. Um, so we observed that, you know, it's very important the motor that you use because in some cases we, we really see this mechanical effect. In other cases, we see it could be thermal. And in other cases, even some motors can produce ROS. So it's very, at the fundamental level, having the motor in a membrane, it changed the photochemical properties. So that's also open question there, like how the membrane will affect the photochemical properties because some motors can maintain their, their mechanical properties while others will follow a different pathway and produce ROS instead of rotation or, or, or photothermal. Uh, in, in, the, in the example that we show here, uh, we, we did some tests where, for example, motors that maybe doesn't rotate that fast. So our hypothesis was, well, if the motor doesn't rotate, maybe it can dissipate this energy just as a heat. And we did not observe any killing of the cells, which tells us, okay, maybe these motors do not produce enough heat. Maybe they produce some, but not enough to kill the cells at the same, uh, in the same time scale than, than the other motors. But yeah, but there are other motors that instead of rotation produce ROS, yeah. Interesting. And then um, uh, the, you, you mentioned you kind of want to deliver these to other organelles as well. Um, what's the, the barrier there? Do they get into the cell or is it just a matter of like, like putting a yeah, target so, on them? Yeah, so I would say one thing would be uh, you know, the internalization, right? How do you achieve the internalization and then targeting a specific organ, right? Uh, I, we did very preliminary studies in the past where we functionalized with some 
tertiary amines and then they directly go to the mitochondria, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I just want to ask a question to Victor on behalf of uh, Micah, who does not have a mic. Uh, the, he says, uh, it would be unfortunate to have some motors bind off target, and then you go out into the sun for 10 minutes and your skin cells die. How do you, do you have ideas on how to control delivery? How long does it take for the, before the motors naturally deteriorate? Yeah, so we haven't done studies, you know, like how long it stays in the body. We haven't done those studies. I think those are also important. Uh, regarding the selectivity, that's a very important question, right? So what we notice is that for these motors to work, you need a specific uh, amount of energy, right? So if your light intensity is very low, these motors are not going to produce this effect. So you need high intensity. So my theory is that by having just the sunlight may not be strong enough uh, to activate the motor. So you need something more uh, focused and a strong uh, intensity. And then another question for Victor from Steven. Uh, have you or anybody considered two frequency light systems where one frequency is tuned for the stator aromatic system and the other for the rotor aromatic system? The idea might be to further localize any therapeutic event by two independent light beams from different directions. Um, no, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So you mean using two different wavelengths to activate the motor, like one wavelength to go one, uh, one direction and another wavelength to the other direction? That's, that's the question. Uh, I will, uh, well, so I, I assume. Let me, that, let me go ahead oh, and, and, okay. and qualify that uh, a bit. Um, the idea was that you've got the rotor being a double bond that needs to be activated so that it can rotate. And so yeah. you can either stimulate that with a single frequency, or you could potentially activate it from both sides by a photon hitting the, the, the rotor and a hit, another photon hitting the stator so that, that um, the energy um, you know, activates the, the double bond and allows rotation. And so you have, in a sense, independent control, those being two different aromatic systems that you could target one from one direction at one frequency and target the other one, the, the rotor from one direction and the stator from another direction with two frequencies of light. Um, and maybe neither of them have to be up in the UV range. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that a specific approach has been used. I know that uh, the group of uh, Feringa had done a lot on energy transfer photosensitizers, you know, to activate the motors. Uh, the, that has been done where they attach the motor with a photosensitizer, they shine light on the photosensitizer, the transfer energy, and the motor rotates. Um, uh, one of the, I would say, potential issues with those, it may be the efficiency of this energy transfer, right? That uh, these motors need a certain intensity and a certain photon flux to produce the effect. So if that energy transfer is not very efficient, then maybe the motor might not rotate, you know, it may not achieve the full, uh, the, the frequency that you want. Yeah. Alex, do you want to, I, I was actually going to, to bring that, that question back up. Do you want to, uh, I'll, I'll ask it out loud and you can <laughs> answer it out loud. Um, the, uh, so, so one question is, uh, in order to do single, chemistry, single molecule chemistry, you need to know exactly where the, the molecule is. Um, and uh, so, so how do you do that? Yeah, no, that's a really important question. Um, so, you know, the, the approach that we're taking is um, you, actually using the single uh, molecule localization microscopy to locate that. And so, you know, these are techniques like STORM and PALM. Um, I'll use the, this kind of concept of a blinking dye. And so if you, have a, if you know it's coming from a single molecule, you're limited by the um, diffraction limit, right? Um, in, in typical cases, but if you know it's a single molecule, you kind of see a diffraction limit and blur, and then you can pinpoint the middle of that blur down to about 20 nanometers. So we can know where it is down to about 20 nanometers. And that's, that 20 nanometer number is the routine one. Um, people that are like really active in this field or, you know, try to go to even, even uh, a better precision. I haven't seen the latest developments. There might be ways to do it, but you know, I think it's possible to get, get down to within a couple of nanometers, knowing where that molecule is. 
if it's where you want it to be, then you can tag it and, and do the chemistry there. And then the, the other question is, this is a little bit broader, but uh, you, you mentioned uh, like micro and nano robots. And I think people talk about this a lot. And what I have never seen is someone describe like, what, what is the minimum viable micro or nano robot look like? Like what, what is it? Yeah, that, that's a really good question too. Um, I've thought about this a little bit and, and also read some, you know, what, what people in the literature say. Um, and kind of what I've adopted as my working definition is something capable of sensing, computation, and actuation. And so I, I think the minimum, if, if you take that as the definition, I think that the minimum viable robot has already been made. Um, so a, a robot that kind of follows a chemical gradient, like a propulsion-based robot, meets all these requirements. Um, each of them are actually accomplished by the single component, right? So you have a catalyst that reacts with a chemical, right? And so that's, that's a sensing. If the chemical is there, it will do the reaction. Um, if you have a gradient, right, then it's gonna move along that gradient, right? That's the, the computation, right? It's actually computing what way the gradient is going. Um, and then it actuates, right? The movement along that gradient is the actuation. I noticed that uh, uh, Ayusman Sen is here, who's, who's actually done some work in this area. He might also have some insight into, you know, is this, a reasonable definition for 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 a microbot, and, and does do these machines actually meet that definition? Uh, the the other thing I want to just like poke is like I care less about definitions and more just like what 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 should we what should we build? <laughs> um, like what what is what is what is the actual thing? What what should we like? How sort of quickly can we get there? What work needs to be done before we get there? Um, I think is is the real question. But then, doesn't it depend on the uh, what application you're looking at, right? Um, sure, um, but like, I, I like okay, sure, like we can we can create a duel to that question, which is okay, cool. What's the the easiest application to to like do something for, right? So so either either you say. Uh, this it already exists the, the thing already exists and this is it or you say well it doesn't exist and this is why um and so <laughs> I, I think we all have the intuition that it does not yet actually exist and so i want to poke at like what where the gap is so what alex said <laughs> sorry alex <laughs> for jumping in but what alex said so if you if you want a sensor for example then Alex, you know, very succinctly said what you need, right? Um, so, so, so a motor that that senses a chemical gradient, perhaps uh, moves along that gradient, shows up where the source is, and and that's a sensor um, in, in in a rudimentary form. So, so there you you're okay. Um, my view is is that. We don't have motors that are adaptive and motors that have memories. And, and without a memory, uh, you don't know where you are and you can't adapt. Um, and I think that is, is gonna be the next challenge. That's my view, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds yeah. like the, you know, the question between a minimum viable robot and then maybe one that's commercializable i think those are the two different two different goals and you know what you know and, and i think it's finding the right application for a robot and i think like you know some of what what victor is doing right this is definitely very uh, applied right you're actually using it to treat you know treat treat disease right and so and right now he has a, a drill right that's drilling into a cell can you combine that with some type of sensing computation and actuation to have it maybe find the the the, the mutated cell that's precancerous right and then drill into it um so i you know it kind of this is just just spitballing right maybe you could attach these types of motors onto a, a propulsion guided system that kind of patrols a tissue and then somehow senses the senses the cancer cell 
once that does, it kind of kind of computes that it's cancerous, activates the pill. I, mean, I don't know if that's a, at all reasonable, but you know, some some approach like that is kind of what I see for, for a biologically motivated robot. What would be um, potentially useful? I think you have to choose the system carefully, um, but you know, so something like that is kind of kind of where my thoughts go. Um, was there another bit on this particular thread? Yeah, I, I think also when you think about of robots, it can also be where the set of control is because a lot of these devices you can have, as we talked about you know, throughout this, you can have part of the control external to it. And so there you have a lot more you know, capability, whether a person or a regular computer, and then you have either light or chemical or temperature or something that you can essentially give commands to much more limited devices. And so in a sense, it's like the robot instead of all thinking it has to be just the one device, it's somehow partly spread molecular and macro. And, and then you have a, a wider range of flexibility. And whether you call that a, a robot or not, I mean, that's just a matter of definition, but it could have the capability to get some more sophisticated control from outside. And when you do that, don't you need to add communications to the list of things the robot needs to do? Yes, so it needs to be able to sense whatever modality you're, um, you know, connecting with, whether it's you know, light or acoustics or temperature variation. So yes, it, it's an additional piece of sensing that, it, that it, and then and then there's either the harder problem of whether it can send back. Yes, I, it, uh, it was successful or not to communicate backwards. Or, I mean, back out. Perhaps to piggyback on some of that um, is, you know, one standard question that I usually try to ask at the end of this is if there was a number one challenge that you think could be solved, for example, on an enabling technology of a different field that would really significantly advance your work, uh, that would be really wonderful uh, to hear. And I guess that could, you know, piggyback off of, uh, of Ted's questions too. Um, but maybe you have other ideas as well, because I think you know, actually giving people an understanding of at the end of, uh, of of our sessions of like what would be actionable next steps if someone's super excited about this, how could um, people plug in and help basically it was a challenge that uh, our three presenters would love to see solved. Uh, so um, I would love it if a lab of the quality of David Baker's labs uh, would work on building blocks and um, there's a bug flying in front of me, uh, work on building blocks and uh, how to get a, you know, say a 20 block structure with arbitrary things attached to it uh, to actually be able to be made. Alex or yeah, I'm trying to, Victor? Trying to think. <laughs> it's a difficult question, but I think, you know, um, Making it easy for people that get ex uh, excited to plug in, uh, mm -hmm. I think, would be really fantastic. I know it's it's, it's very difficult. I, I have like a practical kind of you know not the grand scheme problem, but you know at the practical level, we're quickly running into um like a computational um, challenge, right? So part of our system, you know, when we get to really the single molecule lithography, is we're going to have to localize the molecule, decide if we want to react there, and then hit it with light. So we have to very quickly do those computations, right? Do the, the localization algorithm, um, determine if it's on spot where we want a pattern and then do it. So that's some um, expertise I don't currently have. Um, I think it's, it should be doable, but you know, there is there's a bit of an unsolved problem there. I'll think about the grand scheme. That's concrete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, say, I think for me, as I mentioned, I think one of the things that has to be explored and we haven't done it, and my group does not have that experience, is trying to do more in vivo studies of these uh, motors, you know, like, the, and, and study like, you know, the time that the motors stay in the body, uh, uh, when or how they are uh, excreted out of the, uh, of the body, you know, we don't have those capabilities uh, in my lab, but I think that's very important. Um, other limitations, as I mentioned, is uh, can we develop, um, you know, motors uh, that are only activated with light without thermal um, steps? That's also other limitation. So, um, can I comment? Um, 
So the um, what you really have to show that these molecular motors um, can do something that no other technology can do. And so Victor, you know, very nice talk. The question that you might be asked is, you know, we can use nanoparticles and more biofriendly radiation, you know, uh, IR, for example, uh, or uh, <clears throat> um, acoustic waves uh, to heat up nanoparticles, kill cancer cells that way, uh, and so on. So what does your rotors bring that these nanoparticles cannot do? Um, also, nanoparticles can be decorated with recognition elements um, so that they will selectively seek out cancer cells, uh, whereas with your motor, it would be much harder to put in recognition elements to, to seek out specific cells to destroy. Yeah, that that's very that's very important. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not very familiar with nanoparticles. One thing I would have to read more, but one thing that I, you know, trying to compare the two technologies, we say what is how do they behave? These both technologies in vivo, right? Like how you know, like are nanoparticles, um, you know, are they good in the body or not? And compared to the motors, that would be one uh question you know and then compare but yeah that's true maybe um the other for example the other works that i showed that were done by other groups where they use these motors um to produce forces on the on the membrane receptors um with these with these approaches uh you can study mechanotransduction, transduction where in uh, usually for example cell biologists they use uh, micro pipe uh, sorry the micro pipette or you know where you can study only one cell at the time um, but with these motors you can study several cells at the time and you have more spatiotemporal control so that's maybe if we don't talk about for example maybe the cancer cell but if we focus on fundamental studies in cell biology uh, you may have some advantage there instead of using for example in other systems they use um, you know, this micro pipe aspiration when you can only do one cells at a time and you pipe it, your, your needle is quite big compared to the, to the thickness of the membrane, right? But if you have molecules that are small, you can create perturbations at the nano scale that you cannot do with a big needle, right? <clears throat> that seems like a great place to stop. Um, Really appreciate the discussion, everybody. Uh, remember to there's there's the Discord channel where you can continue this, and really appreciate all of it. Um, I need to actually think about this because uh, I have a lot of questions that aren't quite fully formed. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>